And I discovered that everything that I knew from doing that, everything that I knew from authoring a book on Ethernet and TCP IP, this is my book Industrial Ethernet, which was published in 2004, which is a second edition. Um, everything that I knew about digital communication also applied to DNA. Everything. Matter of fact, you can open any book about computer networking or digital information and probably something on that page applies to DNA. Concepts like number of bits, symbol conventions, objects, signal to noise ratio, bandwidth, trade-offs between, um, between uh, speed and redundancy, um, all of the things that digital communication, uh, data compression, all of these concepts apply to DNA. And they apply exactly, the, it's the same math, it's the same everything. And when I realized that, I realized, okay, we've got a core principle through which we can look at this problem. And so, uh, and thus began a whole search and a whole investigation. Um, so I, I want to uh, outline a demarcation that I've seen um, in the world. Uh, about uh, 15 years ago, my wife went to the library and she brought home a book on fractals. Um, and I didn't really know much about fractals. And I opened this book and you guys all seen the Mandelbrot set and fractals and everything. And, and this book is explaining, hey, this is actually very profound because this describes a phenomenon in the world called chaos. And chaos governs how, how snowflakes get made and how trees grow and sand dunes and stalactites and stalactites and all this kind of stuff. And the world, purely through the laws of physics, creates these kind of patterns naturally. So in the case of tornadoes and hurricanes, if you take hot air, cold air, moisture, and time, and you put things together in just the right amounts, you will get a tornado, you will get a hurricane. Nobody has to design it. Okay. Similarly, snowflakes, water, cold air, gravity, wind, and time. If, if the conditions are right, you'll get snowflakes. Uh, snowflakes don't have to be designed by anyone. Okay. Now, um, let's talk about something else in the world. Let's talk about designs. Think of music. Uh, somebody plays music, they're playing from a sheet of paper. Now the sheet of paper and the music you hear, they're both music, but they exist in different forms. The sheet of paper is a symbolic representation of music, and based on the convention of symbols that has been chosen for the notation of music, um, you then follow, you read the music and you play it and you get a real implementation of what is abstractly represented on the piece of paper. And it's the same thing if you record and play back a CD. You have an abstract representation of a sound which has been encoded and then it's decoded and you play it back. Similarly, code. You guys know all about code. That's the kind of stuff you do here at Lucent. Um, Microsoft Windows, on the right side is the implementation. On the left side is what's actually on the Windows CD or actually on your hard drive. So you have, you have, a, you have a, a conception and you have an implementation. They're the same thing, but one's abstract and one's real. Now, you have patterns like stalagmites and stalactites and snowflakes. They come from matter and energy. They require no thought or planning on anybody's part. Um, and they're naturally occurring. But information. Information requires code. Okay? Um, if you're going to actually have them, you have to have matter and energy and information, and it requires thought. There has to be a premeditated, arbitrary decision about what the scheme of coding is going to be. And you can't derive Microsoft Windows from the laws of physics. You can't derive English from the laws of physics. You can't derive ASCII from the laws of physics. It's arbitrary. 
Okay. Now, let's talk about DNA. Double helix, it divides and bases attach, um, splits down the middle, kind of unzips, and then uh, complementary chemicals come and form a, um, a complementary DNA stand, uh, strand. Uh, four bases, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. It encodes all the information necessary for life, and real strands of DNA have anywhere from 500,000 in the very smallest organisms to 3 billion um, letters. Okay? And so, if you look at the language of DNA, you have a four-character alphabet. Now, in the world of ones and zeros in Ethernet and TCP IP, we have a two-letter alphabet, one and zero. But in the case of DNA, it's a four-letter alphabet. Uh, DNA is an encoding-decoding mechanism, as I will um, explain later. And linguistics analysis actually shows that there's a hierarchy in DNA that mimics human language. Um, a nucleotide corresponds to a character, a codon corresponds to a English letter, a gene corresponds to a word. So somebody says, oh, is there a gene for Tay-Sachs disease? Or is, is there a gene for ob obesity? Or is there a gene for myopia? It means, is there a word in DNA that, that, that codes for that? Um, operon, sentence, regulon, paragraph, chromosome is like a chapter. Uh, so like uh, humans have 46 chromosomes, it's like a book with 46 chapters. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the uh, OSI seven layer model? Almost every, oh this is great. You know, if I go talk to a lay audience, they're like, have no idea. Um, uh, I mean, you can't talk about digital networking with, without talking about layers, okay? now. What, what I'm showing here is not exactly analogous. It's not tit for tat, okay? But for the purposes of a very brief introduction, um, D, the layers of DNA also correspond to a computer network. For example, um, in Ethernet, what's the physical layer? Well, the physical layer could be the blue cable that plugs in your computer. It could also be the wireless. It could be 801 point, you know, A or B, you know, 11 megabits per second or 55. Um, but it's a physical layer. You could have an entirely different physical layer and still have the exact same information being passed back and forth from an application point of view. Why? Because the application layer stayed the same even though the physical layer was different. Now, if when you get into most biology books and everything, they mostly just talk about the physical layer of DNA. But that's the least interesting part. Okay, if you, if you, it's like if, if you, if you, somebody said, what's the internet? And you said, well, it's a bunch of fiber optic cable. Wouldn't that be more than slightly misleading answer? I think the internet is a whole lot more than a bunch of fiber optic cables. It's, it's an entire subculture. It's millions and millions of, of computer programs and web pages. And, and so the interesting part of DNA is all the upper layers. The least interesting part is the A, C, G, and T. And so, and, and so as I began to explore this, I realized that the key to explaining or describing or modeling evolution has everything to do with layers. Okay? How do the layers get rearranged so that new organisms could exist. And where did they come from in the first place? And where did the genetic code come from? You can't derive the genetic code from the laws of physics. ACGT is four letter code. How come it's not two? How come it's not six? How come it's not eight? You can read all kinds of biology papers that discuss what if it was a two letter code, or what if it was a four, or it was a four, what if it was six, what if it was eight, what if it was hexadecimal? You can, you can find discussions of all that, and you actually 
find analysis that says, well, actually, a four-letter code appears to be the best choice out of all the possible ones for a number of reasons I don't have to go into today. But it's arbitrary. You can't 